Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We're in Matthew chapter 24, but let's not start there. Let's start in 2 Thessalonians 2, and let's, let's go to the place where I, I know as I was reading this, I was going to say that God tells us this. What I can tell you is, this is the place where I decided that what I had believed about the timing of our translation, the resurrection, being caught up, the rapture, I don't have a problem with any of those terms at all. They're all biblical or biblical-based terms. Uh, the word rapture is from Latin, which, which means caught up. If you look in a Latin Bible, you'll find the word raptere or whatever um, in the place in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Same thing in Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. Uh, the child was caught up into heaven as soon as it was born to keep from being devoured by the dragon. God's always got a plan. He's one step ahead. But 2 Thessalonians 2 was the place that I believe God led me to believe that I was wrong about the timing of the translation in that uh, I was told repeatedly in books and by sermons and Jack, watching Jack Van Impey and everything else, the, the whole Left Behind series that Tim LaHaye wrote, made millions of dollars on this. The whole Left Behind series is based upon this idea that nothing, nothing happens of any prophetic sort until the rapture. The rapture starts everything that you see in the book of Revelation. In fact, some would say that the rapture is not even in the book of Revelation and that the, the rapture, there is the rapture and then the time of great tribulation and then the wrath of God and that all of the seals, all of the trumpets and all of the vials of wrath uh, are contained in this seven-year period. And what this is called pre-tribulational, pre-millennialism. Again, with the isms. I, I just don't like them. I don't like titles and names and things like that. I just believe what the Bible says. And the truth of it is, God is going to do what God says he's going to do, whether I believe it, you believe it, we believe it, all believe it, wouldn't you like to believe it too? He's going to do what he said he was going to do according to his word. He's not going to deviate from it. He's not going to vary from it. He's not going to stray from it. He's going to do exactly, and, and I really don't think, even, even though I'm disagreeing with what could be a majority of Christianity um, who actually believe in prophetic events, uh, I don't believe God's going to shoot and kill me and send me to hell because I see the rapture in a different place than most people. And I don't believe that God's going to shoot, kill, and send all them to hell because they see the rapture differently than where I see it from. Again, we're to use these words to comfort one another not try to topple down one another, not try to overcome other people, not try to get followers of ourselves and so on. I, I want you following the Bible, not me, not any other man, just follow the Word of God. So 2 Thessalonians 2, um, we're dealing with, um, in Matthew 24, we're at the part where uh, after the tribulation of those days, the sun's going to be turned to darkness. The moon is not going to give her light or will be turned to blood. And then the stars are going to, A, withdraw their shining. B, a third of them are going to fall from heaven because 
God is going to shake the heavens. And so if I believe, and we'll read the context of, of what I just said in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21 here in, in a minute, but if I believe that that then is the place where the Son of Man appears in the clouds with the great sound of a trumpet and we are translated up to him, then obviously things happen before the translation. Things happen before we are raptured up into heaven. Second Thessalonians 2 was the place that God, it just became very, very real to me that the rapture wasn't the first place or the first thing to happen in God's prophetic calendar or his prophetic clock or whatever, however people say it. So let's read again 2 Thessalonians 2. I almost got it memorized, but I think it, it's a very important place in the Bible to tell us that yes, things are going to happen before the translation and they're not, they're not good. They're not good things that happen. They're going to be very violent, turbulent, troubling times that take place. I do not believe it's seven years. I don't even believe it's three and a half years that all of these things take place and then we're translated. So I, you, could call, you can't call me a mid-trib either um, because that's not what I believe. I believe there are other time prophecies in the Bible, but I won't get into that today. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, and we'll just kind of go through this, that you be not soon shaken. That's the theme that we're going to focus on today, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. We have God capitalized four times here. I think that's the fourth kingdom. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. There's a lot here uh, that in some, some of the things I've never spoken on before. For instance, I got an email from a sister in the Lord, and it's, it's neither here nor there who it is. Um, I love this person. I don't know them, but they sent me an email, and they, they threw out the idea. It's an idea that I had heard thousands of times that after the rapture, the Holy Spirit is taken out of this world. And so they were sort of correcting me by saying, what you're saying is that the Holy Ghost is going to be ripped completely out of all of his saints who are left here on the earth and will be without the Holy Spirit. Now, my question is, where does it say in the Bible that the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit is going to be taken off of this world and will not be present in this world. Where does it say that? It doesn't. I'm going to just help you out here. It doesn't. But it's an extrapolation, in some cases an outright change, of what the Scripture actually says. To be taken out of this world as a lot of people say that 2 Thessalonians 2 is saying, that the Holy Spirit's taken off the world. How can we be here? We're full of the Holy Ghost. doesn't actually say that. To be taken out of the world is different than what it actually says. Verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. 
Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Not out of the world, but out of the way. Let me, let me just read you a, um, an example of what I'm saying. Let's go to, uh, let's see, Joshua. It's not Judges. It's where I want to be. Book of Joshua, chapter 10. You remember the, the five um, kings that they captured on the day when uh, the sun stood still and the moon stood still. You remember that? They captured five, the five kings, went and hid themselves in a cave. And when some of the Israelites saw them go in there, they went, hey, Joshua, we got, we got their kings in the cave. So Joshua said, trap them in there. So in... Um, Verse in Joshua chapter 10, verse 17, it was told Joshua saying, the five kings are found hid in a cave at Makeda. And Joshua said, roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave and set men by it for to keep them. So once they put the stones in the cave's mouth, the five kings are going, oh no. Now what are we going to do? They're trapped, right? And they can't get out. So, verse 22, Then Joshua said, Open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. And they did so, and they brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave. And it goes on to mention that they took them and smote. They, first, they stood upon their necks. I love this. Uh, May the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly. These are five kings because five represents death. And they are the enemies. They are the last enemy to be destroyed. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that the Lord will put his enemies under his feet until, or the Lord will reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And then they smote them and they slew them and they hanged them on five trees. And they were there on the five trees till the going down of the sun like Christ then they took them down off the trees, put them in the cave, and rolled great stones in the mouth of the cave, and the stones are there to this day. So, what prevents the five kings from coming out and taking charge of their armies again, or whatever, fleeing, or whatever they're going to do? What prevents those five kings from doing that? The stones that Joshua's men put in the mouth of the cave. Once Joshua gets ready to deal with them, what does he do? He removes the stones out of the way. So instead of believing that the Holy Ghost is going to be taken completely off the world and as the person wrote, God's people stripped of the Holy Ghost, which is not going to happen, whatever it's referencing here, only he who now doth will he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Not out of the world, but simply moved out of the way. So that I mean think of um, think of the birth of a child. And at the timing of the birth, I know this because my wife has had four children the timing of the birth, there is a mucus plug that I won't get go beyond the description of what I just said, but there is a mucus plug that holds everything in and separates the womb from the outside world. I'll put it that way. And once, you know, the doctor notes that once the mucus plug is gone, the, the birth is imminent, okay? The birth is imminent because that's one of the signs that doctors look for to tell whether or not a woman's ready to have a child or not. Is that mucus plug is taken out of the way. And that's it, that is exactly what is said in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. The Holy, if this is the Holy Ghost, He's not taken out of the world. He is taken out of the way. And there is a significant difference. Once he's taken out of the way, 
then, verse 8, shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And so, if I'm to take this as, as it is written, then I must believe that significant events take place prior to the day of Christ when he gathers us unto himself. That's what I must believe. You may disagree, and I don't have a problem with your disagreement. I understand that not too many people see it that way. Not too many people see eye to eye on most anything. But this is something I believe is biblical. So now, let's take that because Paul said that you be not soon shaken in mind. And we're going to actually end with this verse along with something from Hebrews, a warning from the book of Hebrews and an admonition from the book of Hebrews. You could call this the shaking because that is precisely what is going to happen on this day. So let's go to Matthew chapter 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And, and I want you to think of things that are shaken in the Bible. That's what we're going to examine today. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 and 17. I also believe Revelation chapter 10, verse 7, I believe, that uh, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as it is written by his servants, the prophets. The mystery of God being done, over with, complete. Part of that mystery is that Israel, the Jews, do not believe Jesus is the Messiah. And Paul said in Romans that, Beloved, be not ignorant of this mystery, that blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. So once it's time for the Gentiles to be done and over with. He's going to translate the Gentile saints, and then he's going to open the other eye of Israel. They're not going to be partially blinded. They're going to be fully sighted, and they're going to see. They're going to, the veil's going to be taken off Moses' face. They're going to see the Messiah there. The light's going to shine on them. They're going to believe the New Testament, they're, and they're going to accept it by, they're going to be saved by grace through faith. It's exactly what I believe. Um, he shall send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet, and they shall gather, same words here, shaken and gather, that we find in 2 Thessalonians 2. Gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, some say, Pastor, see, you're wrong. He's, here he's only gathering them from one end of heaven. Hang on. Mark and Luke complete the thoughts. They're not talking about separate things. It's like when you look at what is written above the cross is different in all four Gospels. One says, this is the King of the Jews. Another one says, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Another one says, this is Jesus of Nazareth. When you put all four together, you get the exact writing that was written Above the head of Christ on the cross, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. You're not talking about four separate crucifixions. You're talking about one crucifixion, one and four different accounts that when you combine them together, you get the entirety of what happened. And so Mark says in Mark 13, verse 24, But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. There's the word again. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. That's where we're going to meet him at, in the clouds. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. See, Mark finishes the thought. 
and the saying of Jesus, whereas Matthew, for whatever reason, did not include from the uttermost part of the earth, Mark did. And you don't say that's a contradiction. You say it's completing what the, the truth of the gospel. Now, here's something I just thought of. This just in from the Holy Ghost, um, Revelation 7, because he mentions here the four winds. And in Revelation 7, we do have two distinct, different groups. We have the 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe, Reuben, uh, Gad, Judah, Asher, Nephtali, Manasseh, and so on. And then, after the listing and the sealing in the foreheads of the 144,000, we have the great multitude of all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues. One, two, three, four, God, because they're saved by the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the Gentiles that now appear around the throne in heaven. And it's all started by Revelation 7, verse 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four, the four corners of the four directions, north, south, east, and west. The earth is not flat and shaped like a square. Um, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And it mentions the four winds of the earth, from the four corners of the earth. If you remember in Ezekiel 37, where Ezekiel was prophesying to the dry bones, what does he prophesy to? The four winds. And the four winds come and blow, and when they blow, they breathe life into the, he prophesies once, and the bones come together, and flesh and sinew, and muscles, and organs, and everything else appear on the bones like humans, but they're not alive. So then he says, prophesy again. When he prophesied the first time, that's Christ's first coming. When he prophesied the second time, that's his second coming. And when he comes the second time, the four winds, he prophesied to the four winds, come and breathe life into these dry bones, and they rise up and live. Hallelujah. So the, I think there's a connection between Ezekiel 37, Revelation 7, Mark 13, Matthew 24, where he mentions the four winds. Since it's the number four, it's related to the gospel, but this is spirit wind. Not like when the wind blows outside, it's spirit wind. It is the Holy Ghost of God, I believe. Luke 21, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. I love that. I love that. Study the word redemption, redeemed. Um, anything related to redeem, redeemer, he is my redeemer. I was reading in Job this morning, part of my Bible reading. I know that my redeemer liveth and shall stand on the earth in the last day. Job said that. He said that Job, we think, was the first book of the Bible written. He, we think that he lived about the same time as Abraham. And Job, even all the way back then, 4,000 years ago, he says, I know that my Redeemer liveth and he shall stand on the earth in the last day. And Job, you're right. He's going to do that. Uh, he mentions, they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. Where? In the clouds in the air, 
and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This is why I don't want to argue with anybody about these words. Let's not do that. Let's just read them and believe them and trust God that he knows what he's doing. And I do trust him with all my heart. But I believe that before he comes, there's a shaking that's going to take place. He mentions here in Luke that men's hearts are going to fail them for fear. And when Paul said in 2 Thessalonians that you be not soon shaken in mind, that has the idea that something can shake us and rattle us and cause anxiety. Listen, I know all about anxiety. Having these little panic attacks and stuff like that, like when you hear bad news, you shake and it's the adrenaline and the vagus nerves coming out of the mind, it affects the heart, the lungs, the stomach, and the bowels. And you can't control that. There's no way in the world to overcome that and control that. God has to do it for you. So I believe that on the day when the shaking takes place, we won't shake. And we won't be afraid. And it won't be of our own doing. It'll be of the Lord. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 2. In verse 17, the Lord says, And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down. This is why he's doing it. And the haughtiness of men shall be made low. Let me me stop right here. What do they call homosexual parades? Gay pride parades. Ezekiel mentioned the sin of Sodom. He mentioned three things. The abundance of idleness, fullness of bread, and pride. And everybody right now is wanting to rise up and show themselves off to the world. I am this. I am that. I am proud. And that's, there's a lot of pride in our world right now, a a lot. No one fears the Lord anymore. It's hard to find people who actually fear the Lord. And that's one of the seven spirits of God. So the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Verse 18. And the idols he shall utterly abolish, and they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to, the, to worship, to the moles and to the bats, we covered that, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks, For fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. So coming before the Son of Man appearing in a cloud in the air, he's going to shake this earth. And think about the, just think about uh, San Francisco, uh, Japan, the Fukushima. Uh, the tsunami, the Japanese tsunami, man, if you've watched videos of that, it is horrific what those people dealt with when that tsunami came in. There was little to no warning for those poor people, and thousands of people died. Indonesia, that tsunami there, earthquakes happening. And when God, God's not just going to shake a part of the earth, he's going to shake the whole Thing. And what effect do you think that's going to have on this planet? I'm not going to dwell on that, but just think about it. Because when God does shake the earth, he's doing so because man stands too proud. And God is going to shake this earth to cause man to do what? What, what do people do when the earth shakes? They fall. God is going to cause lit- literally... I believe every man, woman, and child on this earth to fall on that day because he's going to shake this earth so violently 
they will not be able to stand. There's only one group of people that will still be standing on that day. We'll get there. Revelation 6, because what I just read to you matches perfectly with Revelation 6 and the opening of the sixth seal. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. Let me just stop right here. So the number six, I think I've brought this up before, represents the union of sons of God, daughters of men. That's what's in Genesis 6 and the meaning of the number six. Here, here's wisdom. Let him that hath uh, understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Join together. And it's number 600, three score, and six. So I think at the sixth seal, when he shakes the heavens also, and the stars fall down, I believe at that time, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. I got an email the other day from someone. It didn't, they didn't author the email. They were forwarded some article or video they wanted me to watch saying, we're in the tribulation right now. No, I don't believe so. I don't believe so. And I beheld, and when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken, there it is, of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and every island, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. So think about it, those of you who live in America, the Appalachian Mountains, the Ozark Mountains, Rocky Mountains, what's going to happen on that day? Great devastation on that day. Probably like the earth has never seen before. That's what I believe God is going to do. And notice that he mentions the stars of heaven as like a strong, a mighty wind. What did they hear on the day of Pentecost? A rushing, mighty wind. See, that's the four winds <sighs> blowing. And when they blow, the stars of heaven fall out of the sky. It's not a meteor shower. It's not. These are angels that are falling to the earth because they're shaken out of heaven. They lose the war that Michael fights with the dragon and his angels. They lose the war and they're cast out of heaven to the earth just like and he mentions a fig tree which is what we see in Matthew 24. We see it in other places in the Bible as well. You'd be amazed at what you'll find in the Bible when you read it. You'll be stunned. You'll be sitting there going, I didn't know that was in there. And I'm telling you, it is way better than reading the internet. It is. It's more fun to find things in the Bible than find stuff on the internet. And it lasts long. It helped you better too, by the way. So God said he's going to shake in the sixth seal, just like he said in Isaiah 2. He says it here. He's going to shake the earth and the heavens. The stars are going to fall. The men of the earth are going to fall. And the stars of heaven are going to fall into the earth like a fig tree casting her untimely figs. Now watch this. Revelation 6 is not the only place that mentions that. Nahum chapter 3. Have you ever read Nahum? You're going to meet these people. You're going to meet Nahum and Habakkuk and Zephaniah. You're going to meet these guys when we get to heaven. 
Okay, and what are you going to say when they say, did you read my book? Um, read it. It's wonderful. Nahum chapter 3, verse 11. Thou also shalt be drunken. Stop right here. What do drunks do? And I'm reminded of that video clip of Kenneth Hagin at Live Christian Center. This was done back in the 90s before he died. Packed audience. VIPs, Kenneth Copeland, Gloria Copeland are there. They were having a big drunk fest because Kenneth Hagin is going around and he actually alters scripture when he says that uh, be ye not filled with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled, be ye drunk with the Holy Ghost. He altered scripture, he added a word, be ye drunk with the Holy Scripture, with the Holy Ghost. He added that to the scripture. The Bible doesn't tell you anywhere to get drunk for God. Drunks fall down. <laughs> Drunks <laughs> fall down. <laughs> be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled, be drunk. <laughs> Drunks fall down. Drunks reel around. <laughs> oh, I've been drinking. I've been drinking of the Holy Ghost. It tells you nothing. It tells you to be sober so you know where the lion is and who he is. Thou also shalt be drunken. Thou shalt be hid. Thou also shalt seek strength because of the enemy. All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first ripe figs. If they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. So, the figs, according to Revelation 6, are the stars of heaven. And if I'm understanding Nahum correctly, what's going to happen? When those stars fall, men will receive them. If they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. To me, that's interesting. Somehow, I don't know exactly how it's going to happen, but somehow, some way, when they mingle themselves with the seed of men, man receives it. And it's not done serendipitously. It's not done in secret where you, nobody knows about it. And you wake up one day and you realize you have the mark of the beast. And you don't, don't know how it happened. Everybody who receives it wants it. They're, they're, they want this. They're going to beg for it. I think. And you don't just go walking down the road and all of a sudden a fig falls into your mouth. What happened? I don't know. This fig showed up in my mouth. The eater shakes the trees, willingly, willingly receives the figs into his body. Think of what we, what we learned when we talked about the Catholic Mass and the Eucharist. They believe that by eating God, you became a God. What did Eve believe? What was she told? That when she ate, figs are a fruit. When she ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, she did so willingly 
and it altered her immediately. Her eyes were open, right? That's what I get out of that. Job 15, let not him that is deceived trust in vanity, for vanity shall be his recompense. It shall be accomplished before his time, and his branch shall not be green. He shall shake off his unripe grape as the vine, and shall cast off his flower as the olive. So Job is telling us that this is going to happen to those who put their trust in vanity, vain things. The things of this world are vain. And a lot of times we can't help it because the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. And what that means is vanity means things that are temporary, like, like our looks. Okay, We don't get out of bed looking like a movie actor. Unless, of course, you're playing Frankenstein at the time or whatever. But we don't get up out of bed and over time, our beauty fades from our countenance. Men and women both. It happens. That's the vanity of this world. And that's what Solomon warned us about in Ecclesiastes. Was don't trust in vanity. Don't put your trust in vain things. Don't put your trust in the things of this world because they're going to pass away. And so in Job 15, everybody who puts their trust and is deceived by vanity that he shall shake off his unripe grape as the vine and shall cast off his flower as the olive. God's going to shake all that stuff out of everybody because they trusted in vanity. Psalm 18, verse 4, The sorrows of death compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Think of the days of Noah when you see floods and waters in the Bible. The sorrows of hell come past me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. I love this. Then the earth, look, watch this. So now we have the floods coming in. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were, what's that word? Shaken because he was wroth. Wroth is a wrath word. So it initiates God's wrath, which we are not a part of. God has not appointed us to wrath. So we will, yes, be taken out before the wrath of God is poured out into this world. I do believe that. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and did what? Came down and darkness was under his feet. Did you see that? Who's coming down? The Lord is. So in verse 13 of the same chapter, same thought, here's what he says. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. I love this. I love this. What did the Lord do? He thundered in the heavens. Revelation 10. A mighty angel, clothed with the cloud, faces the sun, feet as pillars of brass, pillars of fire, right? He's got a little book in his hand open. And he roared with a loud, cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he cried, seven thunders out of their voices. See, the seven thunders are the voice of God. You remember when God said, this is my beloved son. The Bible says, some said it thundered, Right? Thunders are the voice of God. So what it says, And when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. I believe what's going to happen is that when the Lord thunders in the heavens on that day, the, and it says the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire, when we bring hailstones and coals of fire into this, now we're, now we're bringing in, it's been well used. 
Revelation 8 and um, the seven trumpets, the first trumpet sounded, hail and fire mingled with blood. Takes place all over the earth. Well, what are we, what are we looking for like in Joel chapter 2 and Acts chapter 2 in the day of the Lord? There shall be signs in the heavens, blood and fire and vapors of smoke. It's the first trumpet. See how it's all connected together now? So the, the floods of, from Psalm 18, the floods of ungodly men, the sorrows of hell, the earth shook and trembled, the hills moved and were shaken. God bows the heavens so he can come down we have the Lord thundering, and when the seven thunders uttered their voices, John was going to write it, and the angel told him not to write it. I, I do believe it's written in the Bible somewhere. I don't know what it is, but I don't believe John wrote it, and I don't know what it is because it's sealed currently. We won't know until Christ opens the seals. Then we'll know what it says. And then the Lord also thundered in the heavens. So all of this, I think, is connected to various points in the book of Revelation, especially concerning the seals and the trumpets. Then, of course, Paul mentioning that we will be caught up into heaven and changed at the last trump. And I think that is like in Revelation 10, that in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. That's what I think is going to happen. Joel chapter 3, verse 15, The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion. That's, to me, it's, it's another connection to Revelation chapter 10. Let me read that again. Careful there, that page is ripped. Let me read that again. And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. I love it. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. I love you, God. Because even though the earth is going to shake and we're going to see terrible things happening, God's going to bless us. He's going to be the hope of us and our strength to both us, like in Revelation 7, and Israel in Revelation 7. Two groups, and God blesses them both. Mm, 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 mm. Isaiah 13, watch this. Notice I have four things equals fourth kingdom. Watch this. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. And let me stop right here. Let me throw something else in here for you to chew on. When it says the day of the Lord, um, I believe it is the day of the Lord. I believe it's the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe it's the day of Christ. All the same thing. Now, some people say, no, the day of Christ and the day of the Lord is two different things. Now, hold on. How long is the day? According to the Bible, the day is, number one, the evening and the morning, 24 hours. But it's also a thousand years. So there's a lot of things that are mentioned in relation to the day of the Lord. And you might be going, how's that all going to happen in one day? Well, think Bible. He's got a thousand years to do everything. And I think, just it's just me here, I think that the day of the Lord begins with the translation and now he's got a thousand years to do his work. And I think the first part of that is the he lets the beast reign for three and a half years. 
Then there is the battle of Armageddon that ends that. And the Lord comes down and actually touches the earth and reigns out of Jerusalem for the rest of the thousand years. It's just a theory of mine. I could be wrong. Okay? But study it for yourself. Read the scriptures. Don't read books. Read this one. And let God show you things that he won't even probably show me in this lifetime. Okay? That's all you got to do. So when you see the day of the Lord, that could that is a 24-hour day, but it's also the seventh day, the, the thousand-year reign of Christ. The day of the Lord cometh cruel both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. We see, we read that in Isaiah 2. And I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Now watch. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. Now, again, he's mentioning the wrath here. And I believe the shaking initiates that. But when the heavens and watch this, he shakes the stars of heaven out of heaven. So as they're falling, he then gathers us up to go live in their house. Yes, sir. Just like in Canaan. God, Joshua, went and removed, killed, or whatever, all the people out of Canaan land. And God said, you get to live in their houses, in their cities that they built. You can have their cattle if you want. Take over. You're going to move into a place where people already have built everything for you. And that's what God's going to do. He's going to kick those angels out of heaven that are evil and let us live in their place. Now, I, I said four things equals fourth kingdom. Watch this. Verse 11. He does four things. I will punish the world for their evil, the wicked for their iniquity. I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Four things. That, I believe, initiates the fourth kingdom. And so, if I'm right on that, I think we'll see the beginning of it. Then shall that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. But then I think we're caught up. After the shaking takes place, we're caught up to be with the Lord, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Isaiah 14, who falls from heaven? Satan. So this, this is a, and a lot... I've mentioned this. Every time you look at Satan, he's falling. He's falling here in Isaiah 14. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall as lightning to the earth. Okay. In Revelation 12, he's kicked out of heaven, falls to the earth. In um, Revelation 20, he's taken and bound with a great chain, thrown in the bottom of this pit for a thousand years. I mean, he's like always falling. Okay. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's what I think the war in heaven in Revelation 12 is about. It's about gaining the throne. Yet... Thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble that did shake kingdoms? Look at that. Who, who is it? 
that is causing all, all of this wrath of God to come pouring down. Who is it that's leading the war in heaven with a third of the angels on his side? Who's their leader? Who's the one that is the God of this world? Who's the one that has the power over death? Who's the one, who's the one who has tempted everybody in this world? and deceived people? Who is it that has blinded the eyes of men? Who is it that has shaken the nations? It's Lucifer. He's the cause of it all. And so God is going to kick him out of heaven. And notice that says, is this the man that made the earth to tremble that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners. There's five things here, I think. Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, did shake the kingdoms, made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities, that opened not the houses of his prisoners. Five things that's in his mind and five things that God's, everybody's going to say, is this the man? So that leads some Bible scholars who are very smart to say, this is not speaking of the devil. This is um, speaking of the king of Tyrus. And to say that Lucifer is the devil is erroneous and false and blah, 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 blah. Psalm 82, verse 6, I have said, ye are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. That's how come it can be said here, is this the man that made the earth to tremble? Also in Ezekiel, we get, we get the, the backup to this, the second witness to this, which we always need. Always need a second witness if we're going to believe something. Uh, Ezekiel 28, uh, because verse 2, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up and has said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not a God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. How does Satan become a man? He falls. And I think that his power, see, Beelzebub, the name given in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament it's spelled Baal, Baalzebub, B-A-A-L. In the New Testament it's B-E-E-L, but it, they're the same word. Baalzebub and Beelzebub are the same word. And Baal means Lord, and Zebub means the flying ones, the ones that fly, flies. So, the devil's not just the Lord of, get this fly out of here. He's Lord of all the things that fly. You get it? He's Lord of those evil angels. And I think that on that day when they fall, that God takes their mort immortality away from them. It's just just my thinking. Like, think of the wheels in Ezekiel 1. In Ezekiel 1, let's, let's go there. What did the wheels have in them? The wheels that Ezekiel saw had, they, it was like a wheel within a wheel, okay? And what was, what was it special about the wheels? Well, if you have a chariot or a car or a wheelbarrow or a cart or a, a little red wagon, what do you need to have on it? Wheels. If you take the wheels off of a little red wagon, what do you have? A box. That's it. That once it's got stuff in it, you can't move it. So the wheels, what happens when you take the wheels off of a car? It's 
got a seat with an air conditioner, okay? So what was in the wheels? Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went, thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. The wheels is what gave the spirits, the angels, their mobility to move from place to place and go from here to there and on and on and on. Remember what God did to the chariots of Pharaoh as they went running after the Israelites? Remember what God did? Remember what chariots represent? God took the wheels off of them. Now they can't, they can't go anywhere. They're trapped. And I think what happens with these angels and Lucifer, God takes their godhood away from them. Just a guess. But I think that's what happened. Now, Acts chapter 4. Watch this. This is... Let me read the verse. The, it's sort of the end of the chapter. I'm going to go backwards on this. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Now, I love this. When they had prayed, the place was shaken. This is similar to Pentecost. They heard the rushing mighty wind. They were, the place was shaken where they were assembled and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, okay? What is it that came, that led to them praying? Well, the background is there was a lame man, lame on his feet from birth, a Jewish man. And they brought him to the temple every day to beg alms of people as they came in the temple because they didn't have social security back then. If he was gonna eat and not die, he had to beg for it. And they, somebody picked him up and carried him every day to sit at the temple and beg from people. When Peter and John saw him, the man said, you know, hey, can you help me out here? It's when Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man went running and leaping and praising God, running and leaping and praising God. Remember that? And that got them in a lot of trouble. They ended up going before the judges, the Sanhedrin, the 70 elders of Israel. And they got beaten over that because they healed a man in the name of Jesus. So watch this. In Acts chapter 4, verse 17, this is the Sanhedrin telling Peter, James, and John what to do. But that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, Ooh, that's terrible. They threatened us. Then they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done, for the man was above, look at that number, 40 years old. How many days did it rain? 40 years. How many days were the Israelites spies in the land? 40 years, 40 days. How many days and how many years did they have to wander in the wilderness? 40 years. How many days did Jesus fast? 40 days. You get it? on whom this miracle of healing was showed, verse 23, and being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they had heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Four things. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? That's a quotation from Psalm uh, chapter 2, uh, why did the heathen rage? Because they're heathens. They're mad all the time because they don't believe in God. They don't have a savior. And the people imagine vain things. Then it, then it says in verse 26, the kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Now I have a little arrow here pointing that says fourth kingdom. For of a truth, 
against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. See it? And gathered together, this just in, I'm getting another news flash from heaven, from our headquarters in New Jerusalem, in, where is it? Not Revelation 18, 17, it's in 16, yes, verse, Revelation 16, 16. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. The fourth kingdom, Revelation 16, 16. Let's see, 16 is multiple of what number? I can't remember. What number is it? That's four times four. The fourth kingdom right here gathered together against the saints of God. Who do you think is going to win? Well, I, I skipped to the back of the book and found out who won. Okay? It's like recording the Super Bowl, watching it later, but you skip to the end to find out who wins. That kind of buzz kills the rest of the game, right? Verse 28, For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. See, that's twice in this passage that they refer to Jesus as a child. Twice they did that. And she brought forth a man, a child. Revelation 12, 5. Who was to rule all nations with a rod, rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. I think that's a picture of what's coming, the translation, the body of Christ. He mentions, uh, if you remember back, one of the things that Lucifer did, Isaiah 14, verse 17, that open not the house of his prisoners. Well, if Satan won't open it up, God will. Acts 19, or Acts 16. When her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. How dare they say the name Jesus Christ and not be cursing? So they ripped their clothes off and beat them and put them in prison, right? See, this is, some people can't handle a rapture that happens after persecution. They can't handle the thought of it. Like me. But if God deems it as his will and what glorifies him, I'll do it. I won't like it, but I'll do it. So what happened then after they put stocks on Paul's feet? Verse 25, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. And the... Man, I love this. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. 
and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And did it happen? Yes. He believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and his house, and God saved them all. And I would just ask you a question. How many beatings would you take to see your enemies saved? See, that's a big thing, what I just said. I didn't say your loved one. I said your enemies. And this jailer, I mean, he's just doing his job, right? He didn't really beat them. But when those doors opened and those shackles came off and that ground shook, it woke him up. And Paul and Silas just gave him the gospel. Maybe, maybe that's what's going to happen before we leave out of here. God's going to give us the opportunity to preach the gospel like at no other time before in earth's history. And is God done saving people? No. No. So maybe with some persecution added to it, we could become great witnesses for the gospel of Jesus Christ to see people saved before it's too late. Isn't that what we pray for? Now, I'm almost done. 2 Thessalonians 2. Now you understand God's going to shake things and things are going to happen when he does. So Paul again saying, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us is that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, on this day, again, God's not just going to shake the earth. He's done that already. But he's going to shake the earth and heaven as well at the same time, I believe. And this then would be the falling away. There must come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed. And on the day that God shakes everything, heaven and earth, everything that isn't secured, fastened, firm foundation, everything will fall on that day except those who are secure, firm unto the end and are on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, the stone that the builders rejected. So here's how Paul says it in Hebrews 12. And he gives us this example of Mount Sinai. Remember in uh, Exodus 19, the Israelites are brought to God to meet God at the mountain of God. Go watch Close Encounters of the Third Kind. You'll see the exact opposite of it. You'll see 12 people brought to Devil's Tower to meet the mothership, the aliens. And, and, and I was reading, I was, as I was making these notes, remember he's quoting, um, I think it's Psalm 91, he shall give his angels charge over thee, right? And I remembered that in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the government had selected 12 men and women, which is actually based allegedly on a thing called Project Serpo. I'm not going to tell you about that, but I don't know if it really happened or not. But the government had picked 12 men and women. There was going to be an exchange. 12 humans are going to go on the mothership, go up with the aliens, and the aliens are going to drop off a guy, and he's going to stay on the earth. And... Um, the director. Anyway, um, did E.T. too. Can't think of his name. Just real blank. I can see his face. But anyway, he, he bases all of these things in Close Encounters, Steven Spielberg, on 
things that he read and from J. Allen Hynek, who was a consultant for the movie, okay? Before the 12 men and women are going to go on the mothership, they're having a little prayer service with a military chaplain, and it was actually played by a military chaplain. And he's reading a prayer book, and they're all reciting after him, and he says, and may the Lord give his angels charge over thee. Well, who is fixing to be in charge of those 12 people? The alien. You get it? Yeah. So anyway, they're going to meet God at Mount Sinai. And as soon as God starts speaking, I mean, the earth shook, the mountains on fire, and the Israelites are going, tell God to shut up. And so Paul then contrasts us with them. You're not coming to the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. And the sound of a trumpet. What? The sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. By the way, go read Exodus 19. That. God said, okay, you're going to meet with me, but let's wait. Give them three days. On the third day, you come to me. 2,000 years after Christ's coming, we're approaching the third day. When God's going to bow the heavens, come down to meet with his people. <whistles> the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they heard and treated, they... Th which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned. Look at that. Or thrust through with a dart. Stoned is the fourth kingdom because the stone cut without hands comes and crushes the fourth kingdom. Verse 21. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And by the way, there's, when they met God at Mount Sinai, God gave them Ten Commandments. There's 10 things here that God, that's, God says we're coming to. Um, you, verse, starting at verse 22, you're coming to the Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to a numeral, numerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Ten things. Mm. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on the earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Remember, the Lord's going to thunder from heaven. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now... He hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. That's what we're going to get appointed to. We're not going, listen, you tell your Hebrew roots people to lay off. We're not going back to Mount Zion to get the Ten Commandments. We've got ten new things here that God's going to give us. You see the contrast now? I love this. I love this Bible. It's perfect. He's going to shake everything. But we've got a better promise. Verse 27, And this word yet once more signifying the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. That is, thus saith the Lord, when the day the shaking comes, and God shakes the earth, the earth is going to reel to and fro like a drunkard. He's going to be moved out of her place. What, what would the effect 
of moving the earth just barely have on global temperatures, the effects on wind currents, the effects on the tectonic plates, the effect on what's north and south, the earth is going to reel to and fro like a drunkard. What do drunks do? That's the point I was making earlier. Kenneth Hagin saying drunks fall down. Drunks fall down. On this day, everything is going to fall. That's the falling away first. And then when that happens, the man of sin is going to be revealed, the son of perdition. but we are going to remain. We're going to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who don't fall on that day. It won't happen to us. God's going to strengthen our feeble knees. He's going to give us the grace to remain standing while everything else around us falls. See, that's what I believe. Now, do I like it necessarily? No. I kind of wish that it was the other way, that nothing happens and we're raptured. But listen, our forefathers endured horrible things at the hands of their persecutors. And do we not serve the same God who gave them grace to endure that? Will he not give us grace as well to endure that? Absolutely he will. And then we'll be glorified forever and ever and ever. And I promise you, I promise you, the day that that happens, we won't look back and say, God, you didn't have to have those guys beat us like that. That was totally unnecessary. You won't say that to God. You'll rejoice like Peter and John did. But they were counted worthy to suffer persecution for the cause of Jesus Christ. Now, what I've got in mind for the next watchman is to look at some of the things that fall and what I believe will be associated with that. So, yes, more than likely I'll be talking about, you'll find out next time. God bless you. We'll see you. Bye-bye.